No, I I think we're worried about the parking. Okay. Well, I'll order new ones. We'll get a new one. I mean, I've had that happen to mine. I'm exactly the same clicker. Mine does the same thing, but I'm able to kind of. Move it on and it seems like it yeah, that's why, yeah, that's, that's why I was. Well, sometimes ours get beat and we're not aware of it until they die because <laughs> they're not using it and maybe they're not as technology. What are you going to do? Yeah. How's this setup working for you guys? Pretty good, I think. Yeah. I think we're going to have to add the slides in separately because it can't seem to focus on him and the slides without watching how the slides. It's almost, it's too bad that you can't tell. You kind of do like a Zoom. Because with a Zoom connection, and then you could, then you could record the Zoom that was right. Right. I don't know. We will play with it this summer. Can. How's that? No, I just. Aren't you glad? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> just say. Let me let me two. check my notes. <laughs> check my notes. Yes, July thirteenth. <laughs> We'll see if we can't get it straight around. Yeah. We'll load you then. I guess we get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the show. Um, I am David Vail. I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and for the next less than 72 hours, interim assistant chair, <laughs> um, which I'm excited about. Um, so good afternoon. I'm excited to um, introduce our next speaker, but before I do that, I want to, as we usually do with these, uh, kind of go through some of the upcoming talks and updates. Um, so welcome to the Brown Bag History Lecture Series, um, sponsored by the History Department at UNK. Um, this series is offered in partnership with the Carney Public Library, and lectures are held typically on every second Wednesday in selected months here at the library. A schedule for the series, as well as information about all of the History Department's programs, can be found at unk.edu slash academic slash history. Um, but before I introduce our amazing speaker today, and you will be amazing, um, uh, I want to- up like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, get ready, it's gonna be awesome, um, 100%. Um, I do wanna thank uh, Carney Public Library for the continued support of these brown bag series um, talks. And we also have upcoming talks throughout the summer. In June 8th, um, Dean Michelle Setlick will be here to talk about her work, Our ed Editress, Nebraska's First Female Newspaper Editor. Um, so definitely check that out. July 13th, um, it's going to be me um, and my new book work uh, that I'm researching. Uh, the title is Vulnerable Harvest, Risk and Resiliency in the Cold War Great Plains. And then August 10th, um, I'm going to miss this, but you all should not. Um, Lena Holmberger, Cordia, uh, what is it? Cordia. Cordia, almost. Sorry, one more time. Cordia. Um, uh, from UNL, we'll be speaking invisible on Invisible Bolaris, Gender, Nationalism, and Sport in Mexico and the World in the Early 1970s. Sorry, Lena. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll get it right the next time. Um, Okay, also please stay in touch um, for a schedule of upcoming talks and other local history events that we're doing around Kearney and in the surrounding area. Um, this, uh, you can check this out also on our website. It highlights our student and faculty research service and community engagement. Um, so check us out if you are curious about those things. So our topic today, while we're all here, um, the title is Whose Heritage? Archaeology, Looting, and the Museum of Northern Arizona. And our uh, speaker today is my friend and colleague, Dr. William F. Stoudemire, who is an assistant professor of history at UNK. 
um, and he coordinates the public history minor and MA concentration in public history with our department. He holds a BA in history from Florida State University. I'll forgive you for that. Um, <laughs> I went to K-State, what can I say? Um, and a PhD in history with a focus in public history from Arizona State University. As a doctoral student at ASU, Will worked on a series of projects for the National Park Service in Arizona, including a historic research study for the Flagstaff Area National Monuments. His presentation today built off of this work. Will is currently working on his first book, tentatively titled Imagining Antiquity, which uh, will offer a critical re-examination of the early history of the Antiquities Act. Um, if you could, please save your questions until the end of Dr. Stoudemire's talk. Without further delay, Dr. Stoudemire. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, David, for that introduction. I am Will Stoudemire, David Sadam, Assistant Professor of History at UNK. I appreciate you all being here today. I see many faculty out in the audience, and I know it's finals week. I drew the short straw to present during finals week. I am as tired as you all are. I know how exhausting the semester has been, so thank you, uh, particularly to the faculty, for joining me here today for this talk. Um, as David alluded to, the, the talk that I'm giving today builds off some work I did for the National Park Service when I served as a contractor for them during my graduate studies at Arizona State University. Um, I conducted what was called a historic resource study for the Flagstaff Area National Monument, uh, three sites in the vicinity of Flagstaff, Arizona, Walnut Canyon National Monument, Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument, and Wupaki National Monument. And that study was the basis of my dissertation. It's the basis of the research that I do today. And, and the presentation I'm giving today on the Museum in Northern Arizona is an article that's coming out this summer uh, in the Journal of Arizona History that pulls directly out of that dissertation work on the formation of this museum in Northern Arizona in 1928. And I titled the talk, Whose Heritage? Because that's really the crux issue at debate here in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s in the community of Flagstaff, Arizona, which is where the Museum of Northern Arizona is situated. This is up in the northern central part of the state of Arizona today. This debate over heritage is at the crux of debates over archaeology. It's the crux of debates over looting and who is a looter. It's a matter of perspective as much as anything else. And it's at the crux of the debate over the creation of the Museum of Northern Arizona in 1928 as well. And I'm not going to get into all the academic uh, background to this kind of concept of heritage, but suffice it to say here for the understanding that we need today, heritage has this close relationship to the term inheritance and has much to do with debates over ownership over the past. And that's kind of the core question here. Who owns the past in Northern Arizona? Who has the authority to tell the story of the different communities that are there? Who has the authority to control how that story is told? And who has the right to own the material culture, to own the remains that are found in the ground and the archaeological work in that region? That's the crux of this debate. Who does that material belong to? Who is the rightful inheritor of that material? So that's what I really want us to focus on today. What you're going to see is leading up to the creation of the Museum in Northern Arizona that the debate is really between two groups of people. The people in Flagstaff, the settlers who created the community of Flagstaff in the 1870s and 1880s, and the Smithsonian and the archaeologists representing the federal government. They are at odds with one another over who should have control over these materials. And that contest is what's going to lead to the formation of this museum here in the 1920s. So to situate yourself, yourselves a little bit, I know many of you may not been to the region. These are some of the sites that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, just so you can kind of picture them in your mind. In the bottom left here, we have Walnut Canyon. She becomes a national monument in 1916. It's located about six miles southeast of Flagstaff, uh, down a bumpy dirt road in the late 1800s. Um, in the upper left here, we have Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument. It becomes a national monument in 1930. It's a cinder cone volcano located about 30 minutes northeast of Flagstaff. Bottom right, we have Wapaki, which becomes a national monument in 1924, it's situated about an hour northeast of Flagstaff. And in the upper right, we have a much lesser known site, but the important site for our discussion today, which is Eldon Pueblo, which is today a state park, not a national monument. It's controlled by the state of Arizona, not the federal government. A much smaller site located about six miles northeast of Flagstaff. I'm going to be mentioning each of these sites today because they're all part of this developing sense of community in Flagstaff. And all of the people that I talk about today, the Coltons and the Clarks and the 
and Chester Walter Fuchs and others, they're all involved with all of these sites. I'm going to be focusing on Elvin Pablo, I'm going to be focusing on the Museum of Northern Arizona, but keep in mind that these, these debates that I'm focusing on today are happening with other sites as well, for much the same reason. So, now, people arrive, or American settlers, I should say, arrive in Northern Arizona in, in about 1876. Northern Arizona is a little bit different than other regions of the Southwest because there wasn't a large Hispanic presence there prior to the creation of the community of Flagstaff in the 1870s at the base of what's known as the San Francisco Peak. So it's largely an Anglo community early on. Even before the arrival of the Anglo settlers that make Flagstaff in the 1870s, we see uh, American and Spanish explorations coming through the region, noting the cultural resources that are all around them. And pot hunting, in many cases, looting, taking materials from those sites. In 1853, the Whipple expedition, an American expedition, stops at what's known as Turkey Tanks, east of what becomes Flagstaff, uh, on Christmas Day. And uh, Whipple and his men spend Christmas Day rummaging through the dwellings, picking out potsherds and other things to take with them on the rest of their journey. Five years later, in 1858, Lieutenant Edward Beale comes through with an expedition looking to build what becomes known as the Beale Wagon Road, an early wagon road across northern Arizona, and they do the same thing. They loot earthenware jars, and dig up grave sites um, near what is now Holbrook, Arizona. So this kind of pot hunting and looting is going on even before a community is established, but it really picks up when the railroad arrives in 1882. The Atlantic and Pacific Railroad is completed through to Flagstaff in 1882. And so at this point, that the community of Flagstaff develops and begins to advertise itself and the various resources that it believes it has and that can be of benefit to larger American society. Some of those resources are, are lumber and, and ample territory for grazing of sheep and cattle. But one of those resources are, is archaeology. One of the interesting things about reading the early newspapers and early accounts of these settlers is that they very much so see the archaeology, the material remains in the ground, as a resource for sale. In 1885, the Arizona Champion, the first newspaper in Flagstaff, talks about archaeology in the context of the rich and productive harvest fields available for archaeologists. That's a direct quote. The rich and productive harvest fields, which I think is very interesting language to choose when talking about archaeology here. With the, uh, with the completion of the line for the Atlantic Pacific Railroad to Flagstaff in 1882, we pretty quickly see both private and public institutions engaging in archaeology at places like Walnut Canyon. In 1882, James Stevenson, who's associated with the Smithsonian's Bureau of American Ethnology, comes out and conducts the first archaeological excavations of Walnut Canyon. A couple years later, he's followed, and this is James Stevenson here, I should say, uh, pictured in uh, 1877 on the Hayden Expedition in Colorado. A couple years later, he's followed by the Mendeleff brothers, Cosmos and Victor Mendeleff, who are also affiliated with the Smithsonian, are known for creating models of Puebloan sites and cliff dwellings. Uh, they engage in archaeology at Walnut Canyon and other places. And all of this is being overseen by this guy, by John Wesley Powell, the one-armed uh, Civil War veteran and head of the Bureau of American Ethnology in the Smithsonian Institution in the late 1800s. So there's a lot of archaeology going on in Flagstaff in the late 1800s that feeds into the community. The goal of these archaeologists, though, is very different from what we might associate with archaeology today. Most of these people are coming out and conducting very quick surveys, looking for only the best preserved objects they can find in the ground. Only the, <laughs> only the intact pottery, not the sherds that make up the majority of what can be found, the, the fragments of pottery, only the intact pottery, only the things that are most useful for display, either at the Smithsonian or eventually at the Field Museum in Chicago or at other institutions. They're looking for those best, those best preserved artifacts. They're not engaging in careful mapping of a site. They're not taking notes of where they're finding things within a particular dwelling. They're certainly not talking to the indigenous communities who live in the area. In fact, they believe that there's no connection between those indigenous communities and the people who once lived in those dwellings, in those cliff dwellings, in those pueblos. Archaeologist Don Fowler writes about this in his work in the early 2000s, saying that these collecting practices were, quote, no different than those of other Anglos in the 19th century who bought or appropriated what is now called traditional cultural property to enhance museum or personal collections. The practices followed from the scientific view of the time. Indigenous peoples and their artifacts, sacred or not, were objects to be studied and collected in the interest of science or as objects of curiosity. 
At the same time, when these archaeologists come to town, it's reported on the local newspapers. They give talks at the local school, and they're helping to teach the settlers about the value of these sites. And the settlers then are following the archaeologists to see what they too can find when they go out to these dwellings. And so many settlers began building their own collections. Building their own collections. Pothine becomes a routine pastime among almost all of the settlers in Flagstaff, Arizona, almost as soon as the community is created. These three articles come from the Arizona Champion in 1884, two years after Flagstaff is incorporated as a community. And what we see here is the beginnings of the creation of a sense of place for a bunch of settlers who have no connection to this region. One of the things that makes Flagstaff a little bit different is, again, there was no Flagstaff prior to 1882. All of these people are from all across the United States, and they're looking for a way to create a sense of community, a sense of place, to feel grounded in where they live. And they do that in part through pot hunting, through looting, through going out to these archaeological, what we consider archaeological sites, it's cultural sites. Um, here we have, uh, in March 22nd of 1884, the Arizona champion talking about a, a, a group of pot hunters and looters going out to what we now call Petrified Forest National Park. We talk about uh, these folks going out and participating in what they call the great Yankee characteristic of relic hunting. The great Yankee characteristic of relic hunting. In April of 1884, we see Jack Bidwell, Ben Chester, and J.W. Spafford made a trip to the cave dwellers on Thursday, which is just east of Flagstaff. The gentlemen report that they had a good time. When we saw the party loading up at rather an early hour in the morning, we thought from the quantity of merchandise, by which they mean looted materials, on the wagon, that our friend Barry was sending Jack out to start a branch house. Ben says they brought a great deal of material back with them on the success. Just so, celebrating. And here again in August of 1884, Dr. Brannon, a local physician, was a recipient this week of, of a matate, which incorrectly identifies as a Spanish word for grinding wheat for grain and the flour. It's actually uh, most likely an indigenous uh, object. So these kinds of things show up in the local newspapers time and time again. You can pick any year in the late 1800s and in the local matters section where they're reporting on people getting together for parties, people coming to town, people leaving town. There are regular reports of people going out to one of these sites and coming back with pot pottery, coming back with matates, coming back with remains. And these things are celebrated in the community in this time. Harold Colton, who is the first director of the Museum in Northern Arizona, will reflect on this later on in his life. And he'll write that, quote, every homeowner in Flagstaff had a museum of his own. Nearly everyone had a collection of relics, prehistoric pottery, stone axe heads, arrow points, petrified wood, and almost every yard boasted a matate, one of those grinding stones. Over time, pot hunting becomes almost a, 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 a sign of your social status in the community. The most prominent residents of Flagstaff are oftentimes also the most voracious pot hunters. The guy pictured here in his portrait is Edward Ayer, founder of Ayer Lumber Company, which was established in 1882. He never actually lives in Flagstaff. He lives in Chicago, uh, but he travels to Flagstaff routinely, pretty much every summer, filling up rail cars with material looted from the dwellings in northern Arizona, shipping those things back to Chicago. In 1889, or 1899, excuse me, the Chicago Tribune talked about Ayer's home, which was torn down in the 1960s, saying that it was filled with, quote, valuable bric-a-brac, and that, quote, once he built a bowling alley at the latter place, in a few weeks he had filled it up with Indian relics, and no more bowling games were to be played. Huge collections of material. Ayer, coincidentally here, will go on to be one of the co-founders of the Chicago Field uh, Columbia Museum, Field Museum in Chicago, and the first president of the Field Museum, and his collection will be one of the founding collections of that institution in Chicago. The guy pictured on the right is Michael Reardon. He's one of three brothers who settle in Flagstaff in the 1880s. Michael, Matt, and Timothy. He's the youngest of the three. They're all there to run Ayer's lumber mill, but Michael is recovering from a bout of tuberculosis when he first arrives, and so he spends his first summers in Flagstaff traveling out to these different sites as part of his recuperation, getting good fresh air and bringing back materials to his house. And one summer, he visits Walnut Canyon an estimated 10 times, bringing back materials on each trip. And he says of one of those trips, quote, we unearthed many curious implements, among which was a bone needle, having for a thread a fiber of the yucca plant in a state of perfect preservation. Innumerable pieces of pottery are scattered around the dwellings, but it is fast being carried off by scientists and curiosity hunters. However, I think I have the largest collection of it to be found. 
One of the interesting things that you start seeing developing here is people like Reardon saying that scientists and curiosity hunters are stealing all of this stuff, but I've got the largest collection and I'm happy about that because it's in his mind rightfully belongs in Northern Arizona. This is the kind of thing that we're gonna to start to see develop here. And it does really become a sign of social status. When famous people visit Flagstaff, they visit Michael Reardon and they visit his collections. The picture here is supposedly Theodore Roosevelt on his trip through the Southwest when he famously goes to the Grand Canyon, supposedly stopped at Walnut Canyon as well, visited with the Reardons. And many of you might recognize that individual on the right. It's Willa Cather. It may severity, but Willa Cather also visited Walnut Canyon. Here's her signature in the Walnut Canyon Register book. She identifies herself as being from New York at that point. So that is Willa Cather. She visits in, uh, I think, 1914, thereabouts. So famous folks are coming through as well. And, and people in the community start to also see the tourism potential for these sites, the potential to make money off of tourism from these sites too. Recreation becomes common. You don't always have to necessarily loot the dwellings. For many people in Flagstaff recreation, just visiting these places becomes a common pastime. It's not a lot to do in the community in the 1880s. Here we have in 1891 uh, of a wedding party, Arthur R. Van Horn and Miss Hannah J. Irvine celebrating their wedding by going out to the cave dwellers with a group of friends and picnicking out among the cave dwellers as their reception for their wedding. In 1904, the Flagstaff uh, Masonic Lodge holding a picnic out of Walnut Canyon. These kinds of things are regular activities as well. And they begin again to create these bonds between the community and the sites. Because they're important places to these people. It's where you celebrate your wedding. It's where you go on a picnic with your social club. It's where you take a girl on a date. I found one, uh, I couldn't refine it, but I found one article about a, a, a couple, a high school couple hiring a buckboard to take a girl out <laughs> on a date at Walnut Canyon. This is the kind of thing that's happening among the settlers in this time. We have photos of this as well. This is a picture of one of the early settler families of the Hockdorfer family, George Hockdorfer and his uh, wife and children uh, at Walnut Canyon, and another group of picnickers in the early 1900s at Walnut Canyon, up on, up on the rise, up above. These are down in the dwellings themselves, this is up above. Real common, people would show up, they picnic up above, they leave their trash behind, you can still find it on the ground out there, um, and then go down into the dwellings, and often fill their picnic baskets with as much pottery as they could take since the food had been removed. Very common practice. Uh, one of my favorite incidences of this is in 1894 when the Coconino Cornet Band, which is a local band, uh, travels out to Walnut Canyon to hold a concert because they thought it would make a great natural amplitude. So they travel out on a stagecoach, they got a picnic up above. This guy is overflowing his, his cup with some beer. Uh, this guy, for you know, a long time to realize, is not wearing it on his head. Just the way the picture is framed, it's actually hanging from a tree. Uh, yeah, it's a ridiculous photo. Um, and this is a picture of that same group of people the same day down in the canyon. I love this guy because it looks like somebody told him, like, look, chill. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of relaxing. But they went, you know, they, they held a concert down here for local residents down in Walnut Canyon. Walnut Canyon is not the only site. You see people going out to other places as well. These are picnickers at, Wal at, uh, at Sunset Crater, what will eventually become Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument, a group of local settlers having a picnic under a mesquite tree. Uh, this is from a little bit later, I think in the 19 teens, uh, a group of settlers, it's what's known as the ice caves at Sunset Crater. These are lava tubes uh, that stay cool enough during the summer that they form icicles. Local residents would go out and would pick the icicles to cool off their drinks in the summertime. These caves are also sacred to the Hopi and others. Um, so, but you know, very common recreation activity up here. And one of the interesting things we see as the pot hunting continues, as recreation continues, is if you look really carefully at, at settler accounts, at diaries, at letters, at newspaper accounts, you start to see a linguistic shift in how people talk about these places between 1880 and 1900. Early on, when, when you read newspaper accounts, it talks about you know the strange and mysterious cliff dwellings east of town. Everything is kind of framed in this mystery and unknown. By 1900, it's our cliff dwellings, our ruins, our ancestors, everything is possessive. It belongs in the minds of the people of Flagstaff to the people of Flagstaff. By the 1890s, by the late 1890s, many of the most well-known sites were already heavily looted. Um, in many cases, there were probably more, there was probably more trash left behind by picnickers and looters than there were artifacts remaining in some of these sites. Um, and so pot hunters began going further and further afield to find 
of material. And, and Ben Doney, pictured here, is one of the most voracious of these individuals. He's a Civil War veteran uh, who settled in Flagstaff in the 1880s, built this little cabin, which actually still stands at uh, the Pioneer Museum in Flagstaff today. Um, and he developed a number of tricks to help him with uh, looting uh, sites as, as efficiently as possible. One of the more notable ones was he would place mining claims on old ruins, on dwellings, claiming that they were old Spanish mines, not indigenous sites, and that they were mines leading down to quicksilver or mercury, uh, mysterious mercury mines or gold in some other instances. So he would place these mining claims so that only he would have the right to dig in those sites. And then he would amass huge collections. According to Jesse Walter Fuchs, we'll talk about in a minute, Smithsonian archaeologist of Doney's collection in his little cabin there amassed some, was, was at its peak about 3,000 artifacts, about 3,000 objects. We have no idea where these objects uh, ended up. So he's a particularly voracious pot hunter. In 1896, he encountered a site that, that residents had not yet found. It became known after him, became known as the Doney Cave and Cliff Dwellings, and it made headline news in the local newspaper. Coconino Weekly Sun reported, quote, Mr. Doney unearthed a skeleton in a good state of preservation, and now has it on exhibition at his residence. A small earthen jug was found near the head of the skeleton. This is believed to be the first skeleton found in the cave dwellings, and it may lead to more important discoveries. And because so many other sites have been looted so heavily, what happens after uh, Doney announces his, his quote-unquote discovery of this dwelling is other residents descend on the site and quickly loot it as well. Archaeology picks up in the region after 1902. And it kind of goes hand in hand with pot hunting in a, in a somewhat confusing way. And I want to introduce a new figure here, J. Walter Fuchs, Jesse Walter Fuchs, who works for the Bureau of American Ethnology. Fuchs will become the most prominent archaeologist in northern Arizona in the early 1900s. He replaces Stevenson and the Mendeleff brothers within the Bureau. And he, like many of his colleagues in the time, is not a trained archaeologist. He's not a trained anthropologist. He's actually a zoologist from Boston who converted over to anthropology. He got his start in Southwestern archaeology by working for a private organization uh, run, uh, funded by a woman named Mary Hemingway, the so Hemingway Southwestern Archaeological Expedition, but eventually made his way over to the Bureau and eventually replaces John Wesley Powell as its director, working for the Smithsonian. Fuchs, like his predecessors, basically practiced uh, large-scale collecting. This was his goal. Most of his expeditions in the region in the late 1800s and early 1900s are functionally collecting expeditions. In the summer of 1895, he comes to central and northern Arizona for a five-month survey and writes later that, quote, I was invited to make a collection of objects for the National Museum, illustrating the archaeology of the Southwest. The National Museum is the Smithsonian. Especially that phase of Pueblo life pertaining to the so-called cliff houses. I was especially urged to make as large a collection as possible, and the choice of locality was generously left to my discretion. The main object of the expedition was a collection of specimens, the majority of which now on exhibition at the National Museum, tell their own story regarding its success. In the summer of 1895, Fuchs took over a thousand artifacts from dwellings in central Arizona, and he returned in 1896 and in 1897, and again, took thousands of artifacts each summer back to the Smithsonian, back to the National Museum. In 1900, he arrived in Flagstaff to go on an expedition to what we now call Wapaki, which is actually what he named it, uh, but what at the time was called the Black Falls region. And you can see the dwelling uh, prior to excavation pictured there. This is from his 1900 trip up to the Black Falls. And this is where the line between who a pot hunter is and who an archaeologist is starts to get really blurry because the only person who knew of the Black Falls region, the only person who knew how to get there and how to access it was Ben Doney. So Fuchs hired him, traveled out to his cabin, drew some of the stuff that was on display there, talked proudly about how incredible Doney's collection was, and then hired Doney to take him and his wife Harriet out to the Black Falls region to engage in archaeology out there. He thought, in heading out there, that this would be a largely untouched dwelling, that, that Doney could point him in the direction of unbroken pottery, in the direction of baskets and shelves and cloth and human remains that he could excavate and send back to the Smithsonian. He later wrote of this expedition, quote, I found skeletons stretched at full length with mortuary offerings at their side. In most instances, the bones crumbled into dust when the soil was removed. But in one case, the bracelets and armlets made of shell marked the arms of the deceased. The indications are good that there is a wealth of material hidden in these ruins, which pleads for the spade 
of the archaeologist. No concern for the fact that the human remains he's contacting are dissolving away. He's, he's mostly interested in that collection, mostly interested in that turquoise and that shell and those things that he can send back to DC. And so what we see happening by the turn of the century within the community of Flagstaff is brewing concerns about how much of the archaeological material of the region is being shipped to Chicago and being shipped to Washington, D.C. for display at the Smithsonian. This is a backlash to Fuchs and others and all of their archaeology, but it's also in many ways inspired by their archaeology because their archaeology is, is pointing people in this community to, to, to these dwellings and showing them the value of these sites, but people are responding by saying that they want a grassroots or local solution, that they want these materials to remain in northern Arizona, and that these materials are their heritage. In 1895, Arizona forms its first archaeological association, known as the Arizona Archaeological Association. This is a report from the Coconino Weekly Sun, December of 1895, announcing the creation of that organization, and the appeal they made. Any person having relics of cliff dwellers, Indian tribes, et cetera, are invited to donate them to the association by sending them to the vice president of their county. The Smithsonian Institute and Eastern colleges have taken away a great part of our antiquities. There's that word, our antiquities. While Arizona has no collection formed or started, this association is started for the purpose of keeping some of these antiquities at home. You can see the intent here already developing. In 1897, there's a cliff dweller, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a looting of the cliff dwellings at Walnut Canyon. Uh, the individual involved is actually supposedly arrested, and the Flagstaff Sun Democrat, run by a guy named Jerome Jones, publishes its report, using this as an opportunity to call on the people of Flagstaff to do something to protect these sites. He starts the article by saying, quote, this furnishes an opportunity for the saying of some things which ought to be said to the people of Flagstaff about our antiquities, and the relics constantly being unearthed in them. Probably 20,000 people have visited this vicinity within a few years past. Nearly every one of them has carried away some scrap, and many of them large quantities of most interesting relics. You can see it goes on to point out Professor Tukes, Tukes, Tukes as spelled, uh, who had conveyed from Coconino County, the county where Flagstaff is located, and the county seized to two carloads of pottery and other articles within the last couple of years. And citizens, too, are constantly sending large quantities of these things to friends in the East. Colleges and museums are seeking them so that our country is being rapidly depleted of its archaeological treasures. This is important. And we who have the best right to them will soon have none. So there's this backlash against the Smithsonian, Eastern colleges and museums, people sending things back East. It's into this that Harold and Mary Colton arrive on their honeymoon. In 1912. Harold and Mary Colton uh, were just visiting northern Arizona. They visited Walnut Canyon. You can see their name in the registry book for Walnut Canyon there. Um, and they were not necessarily the likeliest of people to start a museum movement in the region. Um, Harold is a zoology professor at this point at the University of Pennsylvania. So he, like Fuchs, is actually a zoologist to start off. Just kind of an interesting irony coincidence there. Uh, but he's a descendant of the founder of the first public museum in the United States, Charles Wilson Peale. His first academic article is on Charles Wilson Peale's museum, and he uh, is operating at this point a small zoology museum at the University of Pennsylvania. Mary, his wife, is a prominent artist in Philadelphia. She gave, in, uh, works in watercolor and in oil painting. She trained at the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, and she's a member of an elite group of Philadelphia painters known as the Ten. She developed a particularly strong interest in landscapes and in indigenous people painting indigenous people. When they visit in 1912, their experience clearly leaves an impression with them because they return again and again and again and again. They come back in 1916. They visit Oak Creek Canyon, Montezuma's Well, and Montezuma's Castle, which are now national monuments just south of Flagstaff. They visit the Hopi villages to the northeast where they watch what's known as the snake dance there, where Harold Colton actually meets the state archaeologist who becomes a longtime friend of his, a guy named Byron Cummings, who's going to come back around in just a second. And it's in the summer of 1916 that Harold and Mary actually start doing their own archaeology in the region, trying to become archaeologists themselves. They excavate over 100 sites around Flagstaff in the summer of 1916 and publish two academic reports on what they found. And one of the interesting things about their reports is, even though these are very amateur archaeologists, they're already reflecting a shift within archaeology that's underway in the 19-teens. They're no longer just interested in collecting stuff. 
They're recording where they're finding things specifically. They're making note of changes in pottery patterns and the kinds of things that are going to emerge in the archaeology field in the 1920s. They're already starting to engage in some of these practices uh, with their work in 1916. They return again in 1919 and 1921 and engage in additional surveys. And at some point, they meet the guy pictured here on the very, very far right. This guy, gentleman, Jesse Clark, J.C. Clark, who's a local postal clerk and the most prominent amateur archaeologist, and that is the only photograph we have of him, right? Would have picked something better. <laughs> Clark is, by this point, kind of the unofficial caretaker of some of these sites. Um, he's designated by the Bureau of American Ethnology as their local representative in Flagstaff. Uh, Colton, uh, reflecting upon meeting Clark, said, quote, it was a great treat to me to find in Flagstaff a man with real intellectual interest in the antiquities of the region. Clark had the best anthropological library north of Phoenix and was well informed on the local archaeology, and Harold Colton and J.C. Clark quickly become friends. They also meet Alice Clark, J.C.'s wife, who's another important figure in the story because she will be the president of the Flagstaff Women's Club when Northern Arizona launches its first museum and should be instrumental in that effort. And that's where this movement is going. Clark and Colton strike up a friendship in the early 1920s, and they start uh, exchanging letters back and forth, which are uh, held at the Museum in Northern Arizona now. And, and one of the major topics, if not the dominant topic of the letters they're writing back and forth, is the need to create a museum. The need to create an antiquary society or a museum in Northern Arizona for Northern Arizona. And it's at this time that they create an alliance with the editor of the Coconino Sun, pictured there on the right, a man named Fred Breen. Fred Breen was the former supervisor of the Coconino National Forest. He had overseen Walnut Canyon, had been involved in getting Walnut Canyon designated as a national monument, was a supporter of preservation, but also very much so believed the materials needed to remain in Northern Arizona. And so in September of 1922, he published this headline article in the Coconino Sun, as you can see, called, Are Antiquities Going to Other Cities? Why Not a Museum Here? And in this article, he reflected the rhetoric of the articles I showed you from 20 years earlier. He attacked Eastern colleges and Eastern museums. He attacked the Smithsonian. He talked about how they were looting this richly historic country. Saying, quote, the Smithsonian Institute and other great museums every year send experts into this country to search for the reminders of an ancient people. Many carloads have been taken away to enrich these in institutions and many other carloads by private individuals for their own collection. And he issues a call for a museum, saying that there should be some designated organization, one of those now existing or another organized for that specific purpose charged with the duty of gathering, collecting, and housing just as many and as great a variety of these relics as it is possible to get a hold of. So he issues this call for a museum in Northern Arizona, and it's the Flagstaff Women's Club that answers, led by Alice Clark and Mary Colton to some extent, but primarily led by Alice Clark. The Flagstaff Women's Club was in the midst of giving, up, uh, giving over its control of the library to the city was looking for other things to do. It was building a new clubhouse, which is pictured here a few years later. Um, and it offered to set aside a room in the clubhouse for what would have been known as the Museum of Primitive Culture. Museum of Primitive Culture. The club, uh, uh, another club member, Mary Boyer, wrote to Colton in the Times saying, quote, many of us have felt for some time the need of just such a museum to keep our interesting history where it belongs. This museum opened in February of 1924 to a lot of public fanfare, several hundred people in the crowd, an opening ceremony headlined by the current superintendent of, of Coconino National Forest, a guy named E.G. Miller. Local residents donated their looted collections to go on display at this museum. Most notably, a, a local minister named Cyprian Babra donated uh, hundreds of artifacts for display. Harold Colton donated $400 for the first class display cases. Uh, in the museum. But this museum was largely a failure. It had no clear direction. It was disorganized and incredibly eclectic. It had no staff, no interpretation. It had no mission. It was basically a cabinet of curiosities from the region. Uh, no photographs of the inside that I've been able to locate, but, but accounts basically indicating that it mixed together pre-contact and contemporary indigenous artifacts, and it placed them on display alongside geological specimens and a World War I machine gun. It was a Mixed bag, to say the least. Mixed bag, to say the least. Colton's not deterred by the relative failure of this, though, and he continues to lobby for local control of archaeology and the region. 
1923, he receives a permit from Fuchs's Bureau of Amer American Ethnology to conduct a survey at Walnut Canyon. By that point, he needed a permit to engage in archaeology on, on, on national monuments, federal sites. Um, and he included a note in his application saying that, quote, objects of antiquity discovered in the work will be duly turned over to the National Museum or, with the permission of the Smithsonian Institution, to a small museum which may be established on the site. That same year, he lobbied for J.C. Clark, his friend, to help follow a road crew that was in the process of building Route 66, which was plowing its way through several different dwellings, uh, suggesting that Clark could be there to, quote, recover the antiquities, some of which might go to the National Museum, some to the local museum, which Mr. Clark was having placed in Flagstaff, he's referring to this one. In 1925, does the same thing. In regards to some additional excavations, he writes a letter to Fuchs saying, quote, I will be glad to turn over whatever I find at the Smithsonian, I would like such collections to go back to Flagstaff, however, should they ever build a fireproof museum to care for them. Each of these pleas is largely ignored by Fuchs. Fuchs either doesn't write them back or he says, no, you're going to send them all. That's kind of the conversation at this point. In the mid-1920s, the Coltons moved to Flagstaff permanently. They established residency there just north of town, and Fuchs returns as well. He hadn't conducted archaeology in the region for some 20-odd years. 20 plus years. He's pretty aged at this point. He's out of step with a lot of other archaeology, but he returns because he wants to excavate this site that I mentioned at the start of the talk, Eldon Pueblo. This is a site that Mary Colton is credited with first encountering, at least from an Anglo perspective, which she called Sheep Hill Pueblo. Fuchs learned about it from the Colton's report, but then claimed that he was the discoverer of it, renamed it Eldon Pueblo, and launched an excavation there in the summer of 1926. He arrived to a lot of public fanfare. It's a picture of Fuchs at Eldon Pueblo and the headline article in May of, eight, of 1926 in the Coconino Sun, proudly announcing Dr. Fuchs, famous ethnologist, is here. And when he got out to the site with his wife, pictured to his right there, um, Harriet, um, he was routinely visited by local residents. The Coltons came out to visit him. Breen came out to visit him. Clark came out to visit him. This is Clark's wife, Alice, sitting on the ground. And for a few weeks, at least, he made constant headline news, a veritable mine for ethnologists at Eldon Pueblo, Smithsonian Institution to reconstruct the ruins six miles east of here, Dr. Fuchs tells the Rotary. They never did reconstruct it. He also told the Rotary he'd make it a national monument, and he never did that either. But very proudly proclaiming the fact that Fuchs is here and that he's giving all of these talks in the community. And again, people came out to view the excavations. These are photographs of the excavations in the 1920s, 1926. You can see a mix of uh, some of Fuchs's crew and local residents in the dwellings, touring the dwellings. Uh, here's a photograph of Fuchs and one of his colleagues observing. It's actually a grave that they just opened up. Um, and a photograph of two local residents standing in what's identified by this photo as a graveyard. All of those little stakes you can just barely see on the ground are over grave sites indigenous grave sites. Um, and then and these are a couple of particularly revealing photos. I think this is another photograph of the excavation with a small American flag on display, which is certainly sending a kind of message. Um, and then a photograph of Fuchs and some of his crew observing the work at hand. But what happens after the first couple of weeks in the summer of 1926 is the news, the Breen's newspaper, the Coconino Sun, the one newspaper in town, stops reporting on the excavation, just kind of suddenly. Quietly. When Fuchs and his wife leave town at the end of the summer, it's on like the back page at the very bottom of the local matter section. It's the last thing in the paper. Barely mentioned at all. And so I had to ask, well, what happened? Why did the coverage drop off? Well, the coverage dropped off for several reasons. When Fuchs arrives, he, it, it becomes pretty clear to Clark and Colton and others pretty clear pretty quickly that his techniques are extremely outdated. He uses horses and plows, which you can see pictured here. This is a blow up of that photograph. On the right. He uses horses and plows to literally plow through the dwelling to turn up the dirt quickly to find the best preserved pots, because that is still what he is primarily interested in. Using this technique, he desecrated 150 graves and turned up over 300 intact ceramics. He engaged in a horribly poor record keeping, even by the standards of the 1920s. These are all the records we have. Ladle. Prehistoric, Eldon Pueblo. Science. No information about where in the dwelling was found, at what level it was found, what room it was found, and none of the kind of stuff that archaeologists in the 1920s would expect to be recorded. So his techniques, again, outdated. 
And at the end of the day, for people in uh, Flagstaff, it's, his, the biggest concern is that he's still just interested in collecting things. This is a photograph, actually, of his bedroom in Flagstaff in the summer. The best preserved pots, the best preserved artifacts that he found, he took back to his room for protection to make sure that they make, 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 it way, make their way safely to the National Museum in D.C. So the photograph is one of those objects. I want to point to two in particular. This pot here and this ladle up here to the right. Because those artifacts did make their way to D.C. I'm still in the possession of the Smithsonian. I'm still in the possession of, uh, in this case, it's now the National Anthropological Archive. The ladle down here in the bottom right, along with some other of Fuchs's finds from the summer of 1926. Clark and Colton emerge from observing his excavations, Fuchs's excavations, pretty disillusioned by what they've seen. Clark will eventually describe Fuchs's work at Eldon Pueblo as, quote, the latest notable example of the hogging of Arizona's archaeological treasures by the Smithsonian Institution. And he would tell one of his colleagues that, quote, after meeting Fuchs and working with him like I did this summer, I do not care if I ever see him again. Colton, a little more reserved, was never directly confrontational, but uh, you can read between the lines in some of his writings. He, he's, he's not happy with what he's seen. One of the other individuals who comes out to Eldon Pueblo is Byron Cummings. I mentioned earlier, it's this guy standing here with a conical kind of cap on. This real guy stands well erect. Byron Cummings is a professor of archaeology at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and he is the first director of the Arizona State Museum. He visits Fuchs at Eldon Pueblo in the summer of 1926 as well because it's Fuchs. He's the Smithsonian's Bureau of American Ethnology director. We got to go visit him. He visits him. He brings the governor along, Governor Hunt, first governor of Arizona, who's buried in a pyramid in Phoenix, and I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> he brings the governor along. They observe what's happening. And he emerges from the summer of 1926 angry at Fuchs over what is going on as well. He actually spends the next year, 1927, working with the governor to pass the first state antiquities law, the Arizona Antiquities Act, which seeks to supersede the Federal Antiquities Act from 1906. Essentially seeks to say that Arizona has authority over federal lands and what archaeology can be conducted on federal lands within the state. Um, and requires that 50% of material taken from the ground be given to a museum in the state of Arizona. He reveals his motives in uh, one of the drafts uh, of this law where he says, quote, that, uh, that archaeological sites have been exploited and ravaged by individuals and scientists alike, with artifacts removed to other states and other lands. You see, again, this motive to keep things in northern Arizona. And so we see mounting concerns. Breen uses his newspaper in 1926 to at least subtly hint that this is still a problem talking here about an excavation at Wapaki that was to take place later that year under the auspices of the Smithsonian and noting that all the materials would be removed to the National Museum in Washington. And here, contrasting a local collector, a, a Flagstaff pot hunter named John Metz, who donated his collection to the Arizona Museum down in Tucson under Cummings, contrasting that with Fuchs's work at Eldon Pueblo and the fact that Fuchs's excavations would be sending material back to the National Museum in D.C. So you see that contrast here. So it's this event, this excavation at Eldon Pueblo in the backlash in the community over both the method and the fact that all this material was leaving the state, that's going to lead to the Museum of Northern Arizona. That's what is going to lead to the Museum of Northern Arizona. Um, the next summer in 1927, a group of people meet at the Arizona, Northern Arizona State Teachers College, which is now Northern Arizona University. Among them, we have J.C. Clark and Mary Colton. Harold Colton, and Byron Cummings, and Fred Breen, they're all there for that meeting. We also have um, Timothy Reardon, Michael Reardon's brother. And you might say that's not the same person, except they lived in identical houses connected by a billiard room and they married sisters. So pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much the same folks. So these folks got together and they had a, a large discussion that's reported on thoroughly in the newspapers about the need for a museum. <laughs> Cummings and Clark made it clear that they were angry at Fuchs. They thought there needed to be a museum to keep the materials in their quote-unquote proper home. And Harold Colton eventually, at the end of the meeting, kind of got out and laid out his plan, which was his vision for the Museum of Northern Arizona, which is the vision that largely came into fruition. He says, quote, the materials should remain here. The true museum is both educational and cultural. The museum here should not deal alone with archaeology, but also with the biology of this region and with science and art. It should be representative of our geology. geology. Geologists are coming here from everywhere to study because here the story of the rocks is so much clearer. 
the art of what he calls our nearby primitive people should be represented in the museum. Encouragement of modern art also should be a feature. And it can be accessible, as successful here as at Santa Fe, referring to the museum in Santa Fe run by Edgar Lee Hewitt. Mary Colton backed him up, leading a letter writing campaign, writing letters to the newspaper for Breen to publish saying, quote, Flagstaff has at last an opportunity to show the effete East that she has taste and vision. This is our psychological moment. This would be something to build up to as the intellectual apex of our town. And so through those meetings, uh, Clark, Colton, Breen, Cummings, all these individuals organized what becomes known as the Northern Arizona Society for Science, of Science and Art, NASA, but not that NASA. Colton is the president of this organization. And this organization works with the Flagstaff Women's Club to establish what becomes known as the Museum of Northern Arizona in 1928. With Harold Colton as director, Mary Colton as curator of art, Clark as curator of archeology, span another individual as curator of geology, this vision that Colton laid out coming to fruition here. They traveled to local clubs and in the community, the Kiwanis and the Rotary, promoting the same message over and over again about the value of a museum to the community, to <laughs> Northern Arizona. The Museum of Northern Arizona opens in September of 1928, on September 6, 1928, with Cummings, Byron Cummings, giving the first exhibits, which are in the Flagstaff Women's Club, include things from Mary and Harold Colton's archaeological survey, include an exhibit on the geological history of the San Francisco Peaks, and include artifacts from Walnut Canyon, Wolpaki, and elsewhere. <coughs> what we see happening as well is collections starting to pour in from local residents. This is part of Clark and Colton's initiative, trying to get the pot hunters from the community, the longtime residents, to donate their collections to the museum. And that happens as well. Clark, Supreme Bobre, a bunch of students at the local college donate artifacts to the museum to become kind of the foundational collections there. Fuchs dies around this time as well, and then are even able to get the Smithsonian to send them a few artifacts for at least temporary display. Fred Breen, the newspaper editor, was especially proud of this institution writing in the paper at the time, exaggerating here, but still. It is said by experts that the collection in the Flagstaff Museum, as far as local archeology span is concerned, has a greater variety and interest for scientists than any on the plateau, not excluding the museum in Santa Fe. Now, it's exaggerated, but they were proud of their local institution. So this is how the Museum of Northern Arizona comes about. Over fights between local residents and the Smithsonian over who should control the archeological heritage of the region. And hopefully many of you are sitting there going, yeah, but what about the indigenous people? Because they're not part of this conversation. Not then. They're not part of this conversation in the 1920s. And in fact, many archaeologists deny any connection between the Hopi, the Zuni, the Navajo, the Diné, and other tribal communities in that region, and, and the people that lived in these cliff dwellings, the people that lived in these pueblos. They deny that there's any ancestral connections there in this time. That takes longer to change. That doesn't start to change until the 1960s and the 1970s. And today, the Museum of Northern Arizona does a lot more work to include these voices. It's changed a lot from its origins, despite its trouble of origins. Today, uh, the Museum of Northern Arizona is both by state and federal law required to engage in repatriation of human remains and sacred cultural artifacts that Colton and others collected and used to justify the founding of the museum that were looted by local residents and used to justify the founding of the museum. They work with members, representatives of different indigenous communities on these efforts. They're not just legally bound to do this, they're ethically bound to do this as well as a museum. They're ethically bound to do this as well. And they do a lot of work with native communities to engage and have them engage in the interpretation and the art that's on display at the museum. A couple years ago, the Museum of Northern Arizona debuted a blockbuster exhibit uh, that was produced in collaboration with 40 different indigenous communities in Arizona and New Mexico. Those are a couple individuals who helped with that project. Uh, an exhibit that's curated entirely in the voice of those indigenous communities. Uh, they also uh, sponsored an exhibit on uh, an indigenous iteration of Star Wars. <laughs> which is why we get one of my favorite pieces ever now, which is a uh, Hopi-inspired R2-D2. It's kind of become the de facto mascot of the museum at this point as well. So they're engaged in a lot more um, indigenous collaboration. So I'm going to leave you with this thought, uh, because we all know that Indiana Jones says that everything belongs in a museum. But what museum? And whose museum? And who controls that museum? And who controls how that story is told? and how those materials get there. These are the questions the public historians ask. How do these materials arrive? Who has the right to curate that story? Who has the right to control those artifacts? Whose heritage is it really?
That's kind of the thought I want to leave you with here. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> If we sort of take this across the world, yeah. um, how would the repatriation issues here compare with that of like the Elgin marbles yeah. uh, over in Britain, where they were, I mean, here they were removed from context and from control, but not from the basic area. Right. Whereas with the Elgin marbles, yeah, they, they were taken from Greece yeah. to Britain. And you know, with a, with just a radical removal where it becomes almost impossible to. So how how would you compare the? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we'll we'll say, I can't still on. The British Museum's not doing as good a job as as other institutions when it comes to this. Um, they they generally still exist in the mindset of of that the materials that they curate are part of a global heritage. It's very much so British imperialist mindset. We control the globe, we control global heritage. And so they will argue that those artifacts belong in the British Museum because they're part of a shared global heritage and the British Museum is the place that all of that is curated and they don't really problematize it much beyond that. Um, museums in the United States, particularly notable institutions like the Museum in Northern Arizona, both because of federal law and because of museum ethics in this country do a lot more work um, on repatriation, a lot more open to those conversations. Um, even if it means, you know, returning collections that may um, ultimately be destroyed, because that's what's supposed to happen to them, uh, because that's the indigenous practice uh, that is supposed to take place for those artifacts. Um, you know, museums do that now here in the United States as well. But that says because this question has been a little more problematized here. I think. So the Smithsonian actually has its own separate law um, passed one year before NAGPRA. Um, and I, it's tens of thousands of artifacts. Um, I do not know the exact number, but it's, it's tens of thousands of objects at this point. But not the Elvin stuff? No, um, not, the, not the pottery. Um, pottery doesn't fall okay. under those laws. It's human remains and sacred yeah. objects. Where does the um, Antiquities Act fall in the timeline? Yeah. Because it's right during all of the sort of looting, but yeah. yet the National Monument has not been formed yet. Right? Some, yeah, there's some overlap. So the Antiquities Act is 1906, so 22 years before the Museum of Arizona. Um, and Colton and Clark um, are, and Breen are all advocates for using the Antiquities Act to protect Walnut Canyon, to protect Wapaki, to protect Sunset Crater. They're all writing letters uh, in support um, or speaking out in support of these sites. Um, so that's a complex one uh, because that, of course, is, is federal control. Um, but what, what I kind of read between the lines as they create the Museum in Northern Arizona is that uh, the museum gives them the institutional authority to um, request the ability uh, to excavate these sites from the federal government. And so this is a part of a different aspect of the story, but once the museum is established, Colton and Clark uh, are able to request from the Bureau of American Ethnology the permission to excavate Wilpaki, for example. Uh, the Museum in Northern Arizona does about three or four years worth of excavation work at Wilpaki in the 1930s during the New Deal. Um, and all those materials go to the Museum in Northern Arizona. Um, so it, in some ways, it's also kind of the institutional structure they needed to work within the Federal Antiquities Act uh, that had been in place for quite some time. But yeah. yeah, but that of course only applies on federal land right. and, and on designated sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Eldon Pueblo is on state land. Yeah. Is there any indication of how much collection occurred on tribal lands as opposed to federal land? Um, yes, Cummings did some work on tribal lands. Fuchs did some, but most of this is happening on federal. Land. Um, without, the, without the consent of the tribal people. Correct. Yep. And do they enter into the discussion at any point through that time span? Um, they will enter into the discussion more in the 1960s and 1970s. There's a little bit in the 20s and 30s, but um, indigenous people, largely to the extent to which they're involved with archaeology in the 20s and 30s, it's as field hands. Um, they'll often be hired to help with an excavation, but they're not asked to contribute as much to interpretation or, or, or any of these other larger kind of issues. 
Um, Fuchs is actually notable uh, in, to the extent to which um, he's one of the first archaeologists in the Southwest to start to acknowledge a connection between, for example, the Hopi and the Pueblos and cliff dwellings. Um, he gets really interested in Hopi oral traditions um, and tries to connect the cliff dwellings and the Pueblos to Hopi oral traditions, um, but uh, does so through his own lens and his own interpretation of Hopi oral traditions. Um, I think the best example of that is Wapaki is actually misnamed. Um, it's a name that Fuchs gave to the site. It's called by, uh, by, by Flagstaff residents, just Black Falls, because that's a waterfall that's nearby. Um, Fuchs uh, talked to some Hopi individuals and became convinced that it was supposed to be called Wapaki um, about 30 years after the establishment of Wapaki National Monument. Uh, some Hopi archaeologists pointed out that it was this name. They've never changed the name. Um, it's actually supposed to be Wapaki. So what is Fuchs's reputation not a lot of work on him. There's literally one biography and it was published in 1908 while he was still alive. Mm -hmm. So like in the Smithsonian, do they have anything on him? Oh, sure, yeah. Like, do they, is it mostly glowing? Or it yeah, it's mostly that he's the director of the Bureau of American Ethnology. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, there are some archeologists who um, I know will contest my interpretation of the Elden Pueblo uh, excavation. Um, and try to kind of defend that that form of archaeology still. Yeah. So what is your opinion about shows such as Antique Roadshow, where you get to come on the air and your thing that you need to buy the tag tail is passed down from your relatives in Arizona? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to private collections, people can do whatever they want. I mean, I feel like when it comes down to ethics and, and, and personal ethics, um, um, it depends on the artifact and how it was acquired. So it really depends uh, on the material. Yeah. The yeah. shows can be problematic. Yeah. Uh, I went to Arizona. I was born and raised in Arizona. I went to college there quite a few years ago and studied while I got Cameron as a freshman. And um, whatever class it was, history, I suppose. And it's kind of fun to see that. I am wondering. Have you been to the new museum, or the, there, have you been there recently at all? Um, I have not been in seven years. Okay. I've been the last time I was there. Um, the interpretation at Wapaki, um, I know they, they <coughs> unveiled a new exhibit there a couple, three years before I went. Um, that's very good and deals critically with a lot of these issues. The last time I was at Walnut Canyon, their exhibit had not been updated since the Mission 66 program. Um, and they built the, the visitor center. Um, so the exhibit was about 40 years old and um, was was bad enough at that point that the Park Service actually closed off the exhibit hall to public access because um, it had a lot of outdated, just arche even archaeological interpretation. Um, Some of those artifacts look like the Fort Bernard area, mm -hmm. Cortez, mm -hmm. in that area, mm -hmm. Pearl Canyon Archaeological Center in that area. Yeah. So what are the Indians? Uh, we call them Indians. I went to college with quite a few of the Navajos. Anyway, what is happening to the things that they are given back? I mean, is it just like skeletons and that type of thing, or is it pottery or the other types of things? It's mostly going to be human remains and sacred artifacts. Okay. Um, and what happens to them is really up to the community yeah. to decide. Um, with human remains, it's oftentimes burial. Um, something to that effect. Um, with sacred artifacts, um, in some cases they go to the museum, you know, the Navajo Nation Museum, perhaps. Um, in other cases, um, they're destroyed. Um, it depends on on what the tribal practices are with that particular object. Are some of them quite interested in ancient history of it, though? Are they studying mm -hmm. archaeology and wanting to learn? Yeah, there's a lot of indigenous archaeologists who. Um, yeah collaborate with with non-native archaeologists today and that's that's really the big transition here is yeah. all of this is is a bunch of white guys from the east doing archaeology and now it's much more 